Let's continue our walk through the 12. Today we're talking about Nathaniel. Now, Nathaniel is also known as Bartholomew. There's a, a handful, several of the disciples go by two names. Some of them are easy to detect, you know, Simon Peter, but um, others we're not quite so familiar with. And Nathaniel is one of those that was also known as Bartholomew. Now, um, what we want to do today is read from John chapter 1. And of course, you have it on your outline. It'll be on the screen. But many of you like to read in your Bible. So while you find John chapter 1, let me remind you of midterm elections that are coming up in just a few weeks. Um, if, if we haven't already hit the deadline and you haven't registered to vote, please do so. We've had that made available out in the lobby uh, for the last couple of weeks. We pray for America. Remember, we're praying for truth to rise up. We're praying for lies and liars to be exposed. We're praying for America to know what to do with the discoveries that are made and how to vote. And then we're praying that the church will wake up to her destiny. Let's continue to pray those prayers. And um, let's, uh, if you haven't made uh, uh, plans to vote, be sure to do that. Father, thank you for this beautiful day. Thank you for um, the Chitties just b being loved like this again. They, this church means so much to us. Thank you, Lord, of, of so many things we're grateful for. This is in the top list, the way you brought us to this precious congregation 24 years ago. Uh, it was a turning point in our lives. We thank you for it. And now, Father, as we um, receive the Word of God today, we pray for the favor of the Father to touch every life. We pray for every one of us to have our lives covered by the blood of Jesus. We pray for every one of us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And we pray that we will all be the um, receivers of angelic protection and intervention. Work in our hearts and lives and give us clear eyes to see, clear ears to hear, and clear spirits to receive the Word of God today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We want to begin the message by saying thank you, Peter, for teaching us the value of the infilling Holy Spirit. We want to say thank you, James, for teaching us that only heaven understands the true value of life, and it will be revealed on that great day of the Lord, the, the, the true value of every life. Thank you, John, for modeling the transforming power of the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit and that process that's working in us. Thank you, Andrew, for teaching us to bloom where we are planted instead of ruthlessly climbing the ladder of success. And thank you, Philip, for teaching us to expect challenges to our faith even as it grows and matures and develops and we have victory through Christ. Nathaniel, we want to say today to you, thank you for teaching us that the path of discipleship is best traveled with a pure heart. The, the path of discipleship is best traveled with a pure heart. We say this because when God met, when Jesus met Nathanael, the first thing he said about him is, Behold an Israelite indeed in whom there is no guile. He said, You have a pure heart. Most of us are laboring our life to get to the day where Jesus looks at us and says something like this. This was something that was part of his initial meeting with Jesus. I, I think about this idea of uh, traveling the path of discipleship with a pure heart. Um, every time I get anywhere near Kansas City, I try to make a stop at Independence. Independence, Missouri, it was called the Gateway to the West. Now, St. Louis claims to be the Gateway to the West, and it was in a great number of ways. They got the big arch. But in Independence, Missouri, it was the place where the vast majority of wagon trains got started. 
And when you were deciding to go west, you would do like most of the pilgrims did, not pilgrims as in Thanksgiving pilgrims, but travelers. You would buy the best Conestoga wagon you could find. If you were wise, you would buy a team of oxen because even the strongest horses could not make that journey across the prairie. They would die uh, probably not even halfway across the prairie. You needed the constitution of oxen. And uh, you would get the right wagon, you would get the right animals. But the history books tell us that almost every family that started west was uh, disappointed and angered by the wagon master because the wagon master would give everybody that signed on to have him lead them west. He would say, you don't understand what you're about to go into. And ma'am, I know that this is something you want to bring. You want to bring culture out west, but please understand, you can't carry this organ with you. To California. It, it, but, it, but I want my children to have music. It reminds me of what Charles Krauthammer said on why there were so many great, he was talking about persecution, he said on wh why there were so many great Jewish violinists. He says, because we were persecuted so much, it's hard to flee with a piano. So you had to have something that you carried that was easily carried. And he said, I know that you can't do that. And, and history books tell us that at the starting point in Indiana, uh, in uh, 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 Independence rather, treasures would be left behind, just dumped out of the wagon, or sold for pennies on the dollar because the people had to learn that you can't travel that road carrying everything that you want to carry even some things that you thought were important. And along the Oregon Trail uh, are, are numerous stories of you'd be going along just through a barren place and all of a sudden you would find a piano just sitting beside the trail. You would find a set of expensive china that had been abandoned because as the journey got tougher, as you got farther along, you realized that you had to calculate every ounce that you carried as you went west. Loved ones, can I tell you something? That's very much like the Christian life. It's very much like the Christian life. I can't tell you how many people through the years I've asked, are you a Christian? And they say, well, of course I'm a Christian. And then when I begin to talk to them, it's obvious they're not Christians. They know nothing about the discipleship of the Lord or they know nothing about Scripture. And when it, this was, this shows my age, this was a generation ago. But when I'd ask them to explain to me, what, what does being a Christian mean to you? They would always say this, almost without exception. Well, I'm not a Jew and I'm not uh, Muslim, so therefore I must be Christian. But there is a deeper understanding of Christian. We're not talking about cultural Christians. We're not talking about being a Christian that's just raised in a general setting. We're not talking about somebody that was raised a couple of generations ago in Christian America. We're talking about a journey we're talking about a following of the Lord. Yeah, going from Sears to Dillard's. And you still are making the journey even if Sears is gone. <laughs> we'll just tell folks we started at that end and we're going the other way. You, you see, most of us need to understand that when we come to Jesus, salvation, we talk about this so much, but salvation has three tenses. There's the sense of past. There's the sense of present. There's the sense of future. There are scriptures, I was saved. You were saved. There's a load of scriptures that say we shall be saved. We're going to be saved. Talking about when we get to heaven. But most of the scriptures kind of rotate around this idea of we're in the process of being saved. Doesn't mean the work is in doubt doesn't mean that God's saying, well, I've been working on Betty a long time. I'm just not sure if she's going to make it, but, but she's being saved. No, it doesn't mean that at all. It means that salvation 
anchors into those three parts of our lives. There was a point in the past, if you're a Christian, it might have been in an altar on Sunday night like it was in my life. Might have been watching a Billy Graham crusade. Might have been being witnessed to by somebody with EE experience. But at some point in time, if you're a Christian, you might have been raised up in the church and you might, you might actually have trouble nailing down when I became a Christian, but you were just so raised in the church that you realized one day suddenly, you just realized, I am following Jesus. And, and it's, it's sort of like you, you almost eased into it, although the decision was made. At one point, I was saved. The day is going to come when I will see him. Beloved, now are we the children of God, but it does not yet appear what we shall be. But we know this, when we see him, when Christ returns, we shall be like him. Because when we see him, we will see him as he is and we will be made in his likeness. And we say, praise God. Thank God for that Billy Graham crusade. Thank God for that day I'm going to heaven. But right now you're going from Independence to Oregon. Right now we're on that journey and that tremendous work of sanctification is being worked in your life. And if you are like most Christians, your pastor included, all along the way, you find that you've allowed things to take up residence in your wagon that doesn't belong there. It might be a trust in something other than someone. It might even be perish the thought. It might even be a secret sin that you hold to and think, I want to serve Jesus. But like the children of Israel that left Egypt, some of them left Egypt carrying the gods of Egypt with them on their way to serve the Lord. I mean, imagine that, on their way into a promised land, but carrying rim famine, other gods from Egypt, and, and they, they, it took them a generation to understand you can't travel that way. So what we understand is that if we're not careful, we will allow baggage in our lives as, as Christians we love the Lord. We're on our way to heaven. We're on the journey. But the sanctifying power of the Holy Spirit will, will stop with you at a watering hole every now and then. And the Spirit of God will say, James, let's get rid of this. This is weighing the oxen down. James, you don't need this in your life anymore. And James, who loves the Lord with all of his heart, James that loves the Lord with all of his mind, soul, strength, and power, he'll look at that box like he's never looked at that box before. And James, just like the, the, the wagon train folks did, uh, uh, you know, a, a century and a half ago, James will take that thing that's been, that he thought he had to have, that's become a, a, a piece of baggage to him that's made his progress slow and he'll take it and he'll just throw it by the side of the trail. That's called sanctification. You say, oh, that's a waste. And that's not a waste. It's sanctification. We're getting rid of baggage. Um, there are, most of us, I should say, have things that we have to work with. It's sort of like building, when Israel came back into the land, they had to rebuild the walls of Jerusalem. Um, it, it's sort of like that. We're, God, the Holy Spirit, is rebuilding the walls of our life and carrying away rubble. You can look at this thing as a building up or a tearing down, but most of us have issues that we need to deal with. Now, I know some people have issues that they hold to all of their lives. I know that some people have issues that they hold to well into their adult years, and when they get free, they wonder, why in the world have I been carrying this box for so long? But some of us are like Nathaniel, where the moment God sees us, he looks at us and says, all right, you're traveling light. You're traveling light. There's no guile. Now, let me say this. When Jesus looked at Nathanael and said, there's no guile in you, what he was saying is, there's no deception in you. He didn't say that he was perfect. In fact, he's going to deal with one of his problems right away. But he said, you are free from deception. 
You're not trying to play games with your devotion to me. And he says, this is something that is precious. This is something that expedites the work. Now, look at the text. The next day, now remember, we have Jesus has his disciples. He has Peter and Andrew, James and John. We talked about Philip last week. Now we go to Nathaniel, who was a close friend of Philip. The next day, uh, he purposed to go into Galilee. And he found Philip. That's where we were last week. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida, from the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses and the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now here's where his baggage shows up, this man with no guile, no deceit, no deception, but his baggage showed up. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Okay. Cana was just a few miles from Nazareth. Nazareth was... And Nazareth still is, uh, my apologies to anyone from Nazareth that may hear me say this, but is still noted as a rough town, as a, as a rough place. Um, when we talked to the tour guide, he said, are you sure you really want to go to Nazareth? Because Nazareth, Nazareth is not a typical Jewish town, and the only thing that's there is the place where uh, Mary's house was, and the, the Annunciation was made, and the synagogue where Jesus preached. And I'm saying, that's all that's there? I say, yeah, we want to go there. But I, do, I want to tell you, there was a different feeling in Nazareth of most of the cities that we, that we visited. But Cana was a few miles from Nazareth, and there was a rivalry between Cana and Nazareth. And, and even today, Cana is not considered anything like Nazareth. In fact, I asked the tour guide, I said, why can't we go to, to Cana? He said, we can. He says, but this is all that's there. They don't even know where the miracle took place. There's a monument commemorating Jesus turned the water to wine. And so, you know, the two times I've been to Israel, the most you get is, and if you go up that road a few miles, there's Cana, where Jesus performed his first miracle. That's it. There's this rivalry between these two towns. Nathaniel is from Cana, and uh, he says, can anything good come out of Nazareth? Now, the, the saying around the country is, can anything good come out of Galilee? The whole area was considered backwater and, and undesirable. And, but this guy, he's amazing. He lives in the backwater of Israel, and he says, can anything co good come out of that town? And Philip said to him, come and see. Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him, and he said of him, Behold an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. King James says, no guile. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? And Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, when I was in Bible college, they taught me this. They said, what this means is uh, the, in, in a hot, barren land, when the mothers were working in the fields and picking figs, they would take the babies and put them under fig leaves. And fig leaves are huge. If you have the right type of fig, you know that you understand why Adam and Eve used them for covering. They're big leaves. And you could put the baby at the base of the tree. And they tell us that the baby would stay 20 degrees cooler than mom would out doing the work. And I was taught that all Jesus was saying is, Philip, I saw you when you were a little baby. Something else is going on here. Because when Jesus said, before Philip called you, I saw you under the tree, fig tree, Nathanael answers this way, Rabbi, you are the son of God. You are the king of Israel. Now Jesus worked over 18 months to get the guys to understand that. Philip gets it right away. Jesus answered and said to him, and this is so powerful, we'll see it in a minute. 
Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And then he says something that's mystical to us, but I think we've got a clue to what happened. He said to him, truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens opened and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Now let's look at the background of Nathaniel and see if we can follow some of these. You guys with me okay? Nathaniel Bartolmi, which comes by the time we get, take it through, you know, Greek and English, it comes to us as Bartholomew. Nathaniel Bartolmi, as I said, he's known as Bartholomew in each of the apostolic lists, but in the Gospel of John, he's known as Nathaniel. Now, I'm not trying to to talk down, but I just want you to understand why is he called Nathaniel and Bartholomew? Well, Bartolmi was like the surname, like Simon Barjona. You remember Bar or Ben indicates son, son of. And, and the closest way in our culture I can explain it is like if I was introducing um, uh, James to you, I would, I would call him James because that's his name. He's my friend. We know him as James. But I could also refer to him as Mr. Smith. I, I could do it either way. Okay, so when he's Bartholomew, it's like he's Mr. Tolmai, or son of Tolmai. When he's uh, Nathaniel, that was his, what we would call his first name. But it's the same guy. As I said, he's a resident of Cana. Um, a small town in Galilee where Jesus performed his first miracle. Close friend of Philip. Philip introduced him to Jesus. He's usually paired with Philip in the gospel list as well as some of the early records in church history that we won't take time to go into. He and Philip worked together quite often. But as far as the scripture account, we just see him in John chapter 1 where he receives his calling and in John 21 where he returns to fishing after the resurrection of Jesus. Now, there's not a lot about him in the scripture. History tells us about his death. We have two major stories um, that both are credible, but we're not sure which is which. Uh, one is that he was beheaded, and uh, the second states that he was beheaded after being flayed by whips that would tear your skin into ribbons of flesh and then pulled away from the body. It's what we would call being skinned alive. Now, I say there are two traditions. The probability is that both are true. He was tormented by being skinned alive and then was beheaded uh, to bring about his death. What a, a tremendous uh, servant of the Lord in his suffering for Jesus. Now, there's uh, some things, uh, about three things, that I want us to observe about Nathaniel from the Gospels. Uh, here's number one. It appears he wasn't the only one looking for Messiah. But it appears that he was a devout student of Scripture. When Philip came to him, he, his appeal was on the basis of Scripture. See, sometimes when we relate to Jesus, it's because of some amazing thing or he met some amazing need. You remember um, one person introduced the crowd to Jesus by saying, come Come see a man that showed me everything I ever did or told me everything I ever did. Others introduce Jesus as the one who healed their loved ones. There's nothing wrong with that. But when Philip made his appeal to Nathaniel, he knew how to get to the heart of this man. And he said, we have found the Messiah that was described in the law, in the scriptures, described by the prophets. He knew that Nathaniel's heart was a heart that was based on what does the scripture say? This is, and this is the approach Jesus took when he spoke to Nathaniel. Now again, there's, his testimony was not need-based. Um, um, Matthew could have said, you know, when Jesus called me, I was a hated tax collector. No, my own family rejected me. People, kids threw things at me as I walked down. I was a hated man. But here's a man for the first time in my life that shows me respect and dignity and honor. And instead of doing what everybody else does, do their best to get away from me, he says, Matthew, come follow me. 
Come stay with me. That's what we call a needs-based testimony. Some of us came to Jesus because I was just strung out on drugs. I was, I was near death. But Jesus came and gave me a hope for, uh, and a reason for living. Nothing wrong with that. Somebody might have the testimony, uh, I was not serving the Lord, but I was dying with cancer, but Jesus healed me. And I came to Jesus because He healed me. Those are wonderful testimonies. There's nothing in the world wrong with those. But if that's your testimony, you need to be sure you get with a group of people that will ground you in the Word as soon as possible, or you'll be following miracles the rest of your life instead of Messiah. But here was a man that said, his friend said, look at what we've studied in the Scripture. We found him. We found him. We found him. So he seems to be a devout student of Scripture. And we're going to talk a little bit more about that in just a minute. But number two, we also see in regard to Nathaniel that he had his own baggage that needed processing. Now he knows the Scripture. What you would have hoped he would say when, when Philip said, We found Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. You would have hoped that he would have said, um, Now there's a problem. Because the scriptures clearly teach that Messiah comes from Bethlehem. Well, he didn't know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem and had moved to Nazareth. He, he had two or three approaches. He could have taken a man of his knowledge of scripture. But what did he do? He defaulted to pff, Nazareth. I've hated Nazareth since we played them in high school football. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? Let me say this, and Nazareth's reputation was severely limiting. Severely limiting. But uh, um, it was baggage, but he didn't let it slow him down. And I, when, when we say this, I want to say this. I, I use the word prejudice, and right now in America we tend to think of prejudice as racial. But racial, or, or excuse me, prejudice can take a lot of different forms. It can be racial prejudice. It can be class prejudice. It can be regional prejudice. It, prejudice can take a lot of forms. And whatever it's based on, race or class or region or, or denomination, any kind of prejudicial thoughts and treatments always work against the will and wisdom of God. It always works against the will and wisdom of God. So he's got something that needs to be pulled out of him. And again, we'll, we'll see a little bit more of that in, in just a moment. Most of us, now you say, well, pastor, I'm not prejudiced. I've, I've got it all right. There's nothing, there's not an ounce of prejudice in my life. Well, you might be surprised what's in your life. You might be surprised what causes bitterness to spring up in your heart. You might be surprised what memories are brought up by a person from a certain place or a certain color or a certain class. You really need to be surprised. You might think that you are doing everything great only to discover that the Holy Spirit sets you up for a moment to rip that out of your life. Arise, Peter. Kill and eat. Not so, Lord. Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. Nothing unclean has ever entered my mouth. He said, I am a Jew and I'm proud of it. But God was getting at something that Peter didn't even realize. The vision Peter tells us in the next chapter, in the next meeting, the vision wasn't about shrimp and lobster and bacon and pork chop. That's not what the vision was about. The vision was about those Gentile seekers in the household of Cornelius, in the Jewish culture. Now the law doesn't command this, but Jewish culture did. You don't sit at a table and eat with Gentiles. You don't come into their house nor allow them into your house. And then all of a sudden he is faced with a house full of Gentiles, most of whom are Roman, and they want to know about Jesus and Peter is in a situation where he's never been before, and then he begins to understand the dream. This isn't about pork, is it, Lord? This is about people. This, this, 
This, this isn't about sausage. This is about souls. And God will bring you to that place. I think in God's mercy he did it right away with Philip. We never see this being a problem in that relationship again. Now, the unbelief, and it was rampant through Israel. I want to say this about Israel. This was a, a time in Israel that was rampant with hypocrisy. The Word of God had been replaced with the teaching of the rabbis. Not that the teaching of the rabbis was necessarily wrong, but it had been elevated so that it superseded the Word of God. And, and it, it was a time when Jesus had to really be harsh with the Pharisees and, and, and say, look, just because you, you have Jew on your birth certificate doesn't mean you're a real Jew. Just because you have a Jewish heritage doesn't mean you're of your father Abraham. It was the country was covered with that kind of misconception. And Jesus said, here's a man that is a true Jew, a Jew indeed. The unbelieving Jews had once said this in the Gospels, and they, they and when they were putting down Jesus, you guys with me okay? Search the scriptures and you will see no prophet ever comes from Galilee. Search the scriptures and you'll find no prophet ever comes from Galilee. The only problem is that there were about five prophets that had come from Galilee. There was Jesus who lived in Nazareth. But then we also have Nahum, Hosea, Elijah, and Elisha, all from the region of Galilee. Now Jesus was born in Bethlehem and raised in Nazareth, which is in Galilee. So they're looking now, even if they take Jesus off the list... They're operating in self-righteousness from an assumption, search the scriptures. Boy, how many of us have something wrong? And we say, it's in the Bible. <laughs> it's not in the Bible. And they said, no prophet comes from Galilee. Some of the greatest prophets came from Galilee. And now the greatest prophet of all has grown up in Galilee. They said what they said because they thought it was proof that Jesus was not a prophet and that Jesus was not the Messiah. They knew Messiah was to be born in Bethlehem. And so the Pharisees were wrong on two points. They were wrong about no prophet coming from Galilee and they were wrong about Jesus not being Messiah. And they were carrying the same kind of baggage that Peter carried toward the Gentiles. They were carrying the same kind of baggage that Nathaniel, or excuse me, uh, yeah, Nathaniel carried toward the people of Nazareth. Loved ones, one of the most dangerous places we can be is to carry stuff in our wagon that doesn't belong. And it changes everything. And if you're not careful, you'll end up believing that what is right is wrong and what is wrong is right. And the scripture says that people have gone to a point <coughs> where they're ripe for judgment. And the sign is this. They begin to call what is evil good and good evil. Well, he had his own baggage that needed to be dealt with. He did have a good knowledge of the Word, but it needed to be sanctified by the truth. But here's his redeeming quality. Now I want you to get this. Let her see. He was a man open to supernatural dealings by God. I saw you under the fig tree just before Philip called you. I don't believe, now, now I have to, this I have to give you the, a, a preponderance of evidence. I can't prove this. But I don't think Jesus was talking about when you were a little boy, I saw you under the fig tree. That could be said of every child in Israel. But I tell you what I believe, this was also a custom of the righteous in Israel. We know this. Houses were very limited in their scope. And a fire was continually kept going because you, you not only slept in the house, had family in the house, but you also cooked in the house. And during the brutal summers, the houses of Israel, those stone houses where a fire had to be kept going, could become amazingly hot. And it was the custom to plant a fig tree near the house so that you could go and fig tree. When you let a fig tree grow, it, it usually, that type of fig tree will grow to about 15 feet and then it will begin to branch out. And if you trim the lower branches, you actually have like a porch under the fig tree. And it was the tradition in Israel 
when you, when righteous people, when you uh, uh, wanted to spend time meditating on God's word or in prayer, you would go to the fig tree. When Jesus said, go to your closet and pray, many people understood that as Jesus saying, when you go to the fig tree, pray, you know, pray in that secret place, not where you're seen. And he's, he's probably, he's under the fig tree, and this is what I think happened, okay? I can't prove it. But I think he's out under the fig tree as a devout man of God, reading about, uh, reading the scriptures, or meditating on the scriptures, I should say. And in my mind, he's come to that passage in the law where Jacob is running from the Lord. He stops at Bethel. And as he sleeps on that stony pillow at Bethel, he re, he's thinking and meditating, perhaps reading about the part where J, uh, Jacob sees the ladder and angels ascending and descending. And then Jesus says, when you were praying, when Philip came to you, I saw you there. You were praying to me. I was listening to you there. And, and, and Philip says, oh, Rabbi, you, you are the Son of God. You are the Messiah. You are the King of Israel. And Jesus said to him, do you believe just because I know that you were praying when Philip came to approach you? He said, I want to tell you there's more ahead. You will see, Jacob. You will see the angels of God ascending and descending on that ladder just as your meditation was about. He says, they'll be, they'll be ascending and descending on me. You know what Jesus was saying? He said, Nathaniel, I want you to understand, I am that ladder. Jacob didn't understand it, but there is a bridge between heaven and earth and all of God's dealings operate on that ladder. He said, you will come to see me as that ladder. What that tells me is that the moments we spend searching for God are never forgotten. So Nathaniel seemed to grasp from the beginning the truth that took other disciples months to figure out. Now what are the lessons of Nathaniel's life? How do, we, how do we wrap this up? Three things that are so important. Number one, if I have a heart devoted to seeking God, if, if I have a heart that's devoted to seeking God, it puts me miles ahead in the journey of discipleship. Do you, know, do you know what, loved ones? If you are a child of God, He's going to get you to heaven. He who began a good work in you will be faithful to complete it. You're going to heaven. Don't latch on to a theology that says because somebody cut you off and, and uh, uh, somebody cuts you off in traffic and you shake your fist and say, may the fleas of a thousand camels infest your armpits, that you lose your salvation. I, I've lived under that. I've lived under that if I look at something too long or I think something I shouldn't think or I say something I shouldn't say or I fail to do something I ought to do, well, I lose my salvation, I fall away. Don't live under that burden. It is a horrendous work of of guilt that you and I can never survive. You can never survive. He who began the good work in you will be faithful to complete it, complete it. I am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed to him against that day. Now, we, we know that's no excuse to go out and live the way you want to live. I'm telling you that if you really belong to Jesus, he's going to get you to heaven. But the question is, how's he going to get you there? Is he going to do this? Is he going to say, Justin, come on, Justin. I'm going to take you to heaven, buddy. Let's go. It's joy unspeakable. It's full of glory. Justin, let me tell you about my word. This is what he wants to do. But if Justin gets an attitude, he'll do this. <laughs> Justin, Justin may pull back. He's, no, Justin, he, uh, Justin, I know you can't see right now. But Justin... Oh, it's a journey of delight. Oh, look at that. Ju Ju Justin, just look. Oh, it's beautiful, Justin. Thank you, Justin. You see, loved ones, here it is. When you come to Jesus, you've got to decide, are you going to get all that crap out of the wagon? 
Are you going to let go of all of that stuff and follow him? Or are, are you going to be one of those that he gets you there, but he's got to drag you half the way? I'm telling you, if you have a heart that's set on seeking God, in other words, some people serve God, they just go from, from crisis to crisis. They go from, I need this miracle to this miracle. And, and God, God loves you. You say, Pastor, I'm like that. I just go from one problem to the next. When the problem comes, I come back to Jesus, and then I get cold, and I get another problem, I come back to Jesus. Well, at, at, at least, thank God, you know to come to Jesus. But I'm telling you, this, this jerking spasm journey is not what God intended. It's not what God intended. It's to be joy unspeakable and full of glory. But I will tell you this, if a man or woman will make up their mind, they're going to serve in truth. They're going to serve with no lack of integrity. They're going to get everything out of the wagon that they don't need or shouldn't be there. Then they are light years ahead on the journey of this thing called discipleship. Okay, that's, that's number one. That's the first thing we learned from Nathaniel. God, Jesus spent 18 to, depending on how we interpret it, 18 to about 20 months trying to get them to understand who he was. But Nathaniel got it first meeting, first day. I imagine during those 18 months when Jesus would say something and they'd, have, they'd scratch their heads, I imagine it was Nathaniel that said, guys, can't you see it? Can't you see it? This is the man that knew the scripture I was meditating on and knew what was going on in my life before he ever met me. If, if he knows that, he can work the rest of this stuff out. The second thing about Nathaniel is when my life is open to correction, God leads me into truth. Jonah's a good example. Jonah was so angry that Nineveh repeat, uh, repented I mean, he got the Word of God right, he got the prophetic vision right, and he was as happy and just as pleased as punch that God was about to send thousands upon thousands of people to hell. He was just happy about it. And then when God forgave them, Jonah's attitude was, I knew you were going to do this. I knew you were going to do this. You know, I have them right where they need to be. I have them right where I want them. And you show up and forgive them. And he was angry. And God even tried to coax him. God said, Jonah, do you do well to act this way? And Jonah says, yes. <laughs> and then God began to, but you know, you know what, loved ones? If my life is open to correction, I might be surprised how many bad, wrong, hurtful attitudes I have. But the Spirit of God, if you're open, He'll correct you. He'll lead you into correction. R.T. Kendall talked about how, you know, his pride was his sermon preparation, how everything was ready. And he said, I got to a point where it, I had an argument with Louise. And I think he told me, he said, I went three days. I couldn't get it worked out. And he, he said, and I was just mad. I said, Louise has messed me up. I'm not ready to preach and it's her fault. But R.T. has a heart open to God. And the Lord spoke to him and says, R.T., if you want to be blessed on Sunday, this is what you need to do. He said, I resisted it because it basically was an apology to my wife. He said, I went to her after three days of struggling. And, I, and he said, Louise, I'm sorry. This was my fault. This is my problem. This is my issue. Will you forgive me? She forgave him. And he sat down and he said, everything fell in place. Within a half hour, he was finished. So God, when you have an open heart, God can continue to lead you into truth. Elijah, you know, especially when we get tired or we're in a spiritual battle and we're not able to rest like we need to rest, we can, we can experience a phenomenal anointing and then still when the battle's over, we are wrapped up with depression and despair. I want to tell you, loved ones, as we move into the new level that God has for us and, and prophetic insight and spiritual warfare, I want you to know the most dangerous moments for you are not in the battle. The most dangerous moments for you is after the battle's over and you've won. And Elijah dipped into this profound sense of despair and depression. 
and you know the story. He was complaining to God, and God, Elijah was used to God speaking in the wind and speaking in the, 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 the hurricane and speaking in the earthquake and speaking in the fire. And then finally God came to him with a still small voice. God was saying, Elijah, you've, you've become so accustomed to the powerful that you've let your life get out of balance. And, and God began to speak to him in a very quiet voice. And you know what he told him? He says, get some sleep. When you wake up, I'll have breakfast ready. And then I'm going to tell you what you need to do. See, that comes about. It, we are never guaranteed that we won't have moments where I call it the gift of stupidity. But if you are open to correction, God, God can do what needs to be done and get you back on path. Here's the last thing. Um, when my life is free of deception, it opens the door to everything God has planned for me. Um, Jesus said what makes this man a true Jew is that he doesn't hide behind deceptive phrases. You remember I've told you about that passage about the single eye and the, the word that, that single eye comes from is basically the word unfolded, ha, ha plus, uh, plus folded, ha plus without fold. And, and you remember I told you that it would be how a, a, a deceitful businessman in the marketplace trying to take advantage of a young girl perhaps would sell her a piece of cloth but he would never unfold it. He would keep it folded so she couldn't see the flaw or the blemish. And when Jesus said, if your King James translates it this way, if your eye is single, but, but what it really means, we, we think that means focused and devoted. It doesn't mean that at all. It means unfolded. If your eye is unfolded, no, no deceptions, you know. Uh, you, you don't present your life like this to the Lord. You present your life, oh, I hope nothing's in there. <laughs> you, you present your life like this to the Lord, haplus, unfolded, single, not, not two-parted with one part hidden. He says, if you present your life as single, what did he say? Then your whole body is full of light. Now he's talking about eyes and bodies, but, the, but it translates into your life. If you can live a life where there's no reservation from the Lord, God said, I can give you more and more and more light. Your capacity to be used of God, your capacity to know God is, 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 is exponentially increased if you're just willing to lay aside the deceit. That's what we learned from Nathaniel. Loved ones, you're on a journey to heaven. You're on a journey to heaven and God's going to get you there. But let me remind you this. Justin, do we need to show them again or do you think they've got it? Okay. <laughs> You can be led gently, or you can be dragged. He's going to get you there. But the class you travel is up to you. Father, thank you for this day, and thank you for the lesson from Nathaniel's life. Father, in Jesus' name, you know the dealings that you've had with every one of your precious children. Lord, this, this congregation is phenomenal. They are absolutely phenomenal. But Lord, probably every one of us has either gone through that struggle or maybe is about to go through that struggle or maybe we're in it right now where God is touching those places in our lives that we need to let go of. I ask in Jesus' name, Holy Spirit, that you would come and convince every one of us to do what I can't convince them to do. Nobody could convince me to do it. It has to be the work of the Holy Spirit. Put your finger on those areas of our lives that we need to take out of the wagon. We're crossing a great prairie. We're crossing hostile land. And you, the wagon master, has promised to get us there. Thank you for that. But Lord, our journey is so difficult at times because of what we refuse to let go of. I ask for every child of God, I ask for every child of God 
by the power of the Holy Spirit, if there's anything in our lives, whether it's an attitude, an action, a disposition, a habit, disobedience, whatever it is, if there's anything in our life that slows us down on the journey, touch our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit right now. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. Father, if there's anyone here that does not know you as Lord and Savior, please, Lord, give them the grace to come and speak to the altar teams before they leave today and get started on the journey of a lifetime, the journey to the city whose builder and maker is God. We thank you for that in Jesus' name. Would you stand with me?